full screen. Looks good. Okay, great. Okay, um, I think we'll get started. We're at about 1.46 and we have a lot of content to cover. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Megan Mahoney and I'm the Director of Scientific Affairs and Training Programs at BioCanRx. And I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to our third session of our summit speaker series, which was developed in lieu of a face-to-face -face summit for cancer immunotherapy conference that was to take place in November of uh, 2020. Um, um, today's session is titled Cove Immuno, a randomized phase three trial of vaccination with IMM 101 versus observation for the prevention of severe COVID-19 um, related infections in cancer patients at increased risk of exposure. So uh, Cove Immuno, I think is what I'll, I'll call it um, ongoing. Um, for more information about today's session, as well as the speakers' bios and other um, information regarding the session, please do visit the uh, website, and I'll be linking that information in the chat box momentarily. So, I'd like to kick us off by introducing Judy Needham. She's going to present a plain language summary of um, Dr. Rebecca Auer and Chris O'Callaghan's talks and also present the patient perspective. And she's in a really great place to do this because she is in fact the patient rep on the COVID immuno clinical trial um, group. So with that being said, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Judy, I will pass it on to you for opening remarks and April, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing your screen. Thank you very much, Megan, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. And I'd like to also thank everybody for joining us. Um, we're really excited to be here and talking to you about uh, IC8 today. And uh, just in terms of um, questions, um, I'm happy to entertain any questions. However, I, it might be better to defer questions to the very end because I know that Rebecca and Chris will certainly cover a lot of um, more detail that, than what I'm going to cover in my discussion. And also, in addition to questions, um, I would like to ask and call upon you and your areas of, of expertise to provide us some feedback at the end of this presentation in terms of um, what you see are opportunities for us to create better awareness um, of, of this trial amongst cancer patients in, in Canada. So I'll just put that, that um, seed out there to uh, hope you'll be able to um, help us with that once we're uh, finished presenting this to you. So um, I am Judy Needham and I, I am the patient representative. Um, that's the hat I'm wearing for, for this discussion today. And uh, next slide, please. So my objectives here today are to give you a very plain language patient overview of IC8 and also I want to talk a little bit about my role as a patient a representative, a patient partner in, in this trial. Next slide. Before I do that though, uh, we are with the Canadian Cancer Trials Group and um, in case you're not aware, the Can Canadian Cancer Trials Group is a cooperative acad academic oncology uh, have to just change my screen here so I can see, um, oncology group. And we are supported by the Canadian Cancer Society Research Institute and the Canadian Cancer Society. So what we do is design and administer academic clinical trials in cancer therapy, supportive care and cancer prevention across Canada. We do this through a, a collab collaborative network of researchers, physicians, scientists, statisticians and patient partners, internationally recognized for finding the treatment that give people with cancer longer and better quality of lives. Next slide, please. So let's get to it. Let's talk about IC8. So what is the purpose of this trial? The purpose of the trial is to find out if immunization with IMM 101 will prevent or reduce severe respiratory and COVID-19 infections in cancer patients. IMM 101 is a new type of immune stimulating therapy being developed for the treatment of cancer. 
It works by activating the parts of your immune system involved with protecting against viral and bacterial infections. It has already been studied in over 300 cancer patients who have been receiving other cancer treatments and it seems promising. Next slide, please. So why is this trial important? Well, uh, cancer patients while undergoing treatment are at a higher risk for COVID-19 because of number one, a compromised immune system. And secondly, the need for being out and frequently visiting a cancer center. Also, although there is now a vaccination available for COVID-19, eligibility for this vaccination or these vaccines uh, rather is subject to our immune system tolerability. And IMM 101 shows promise in tolerability for individuals who have compromised immune systems. Additionally, um, I, I think all of us are, uh, are hoping that the timeframes uh, for rollout of, of the vaccine uh, could be a little faster, but, but unfortunately those timeframes are in Canada are, are unknown. Next slide, please. So who can participate in this trial? This trial is for adults who are currently receiving treatment at cancer centers in Canada. This trial is not for cancer patients who are not undergoing treatment like myself, patients previously treated with IMM 101 or someone who is previously tested positive for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So if, if, if you were to participate in this trial, what might you expect? You would be randomly assigned to one of two groups Group one would receive three doses of IMM 101, those being at the start of the trial on day 14 and on day 45. Group two will not receive IMM 101, but will have a virtual follow-up at the start of the trial, day 14 and day 45. So both groups will benefit from having follow-up 28 days later than every two months for one year, including periodic blood tests to see how your immune system has responded. Next slide, please. So what are the risks associated with this trial? There are currently no risks or side effects associated with IMM 101 that are considered very likely. In the less likely, which is between five and 20% of people in that category, side effects are pretty much limited to injection site reaction and possible flu-like symptoms. Details, of course, of all side effects, including the rare 4% less people can be found in the um, more detailed consent document associated with this trial. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So if one is interested, how can you find out more about this trial? Of course, always talk to your doctor and other healthcare providers if you are considering joining any clinical trial. You can share summaries like this and we have other materials as well with them and ask if they think joining the trial may be a good option. And again, the IC8 uh, study is currently accruing at centers across Canada. Um, for a full list of participating is centers, you can visit clinicaltrials.gov and, uh, and search using the code that we've got on the screen here, NCT 04442048. And again, this trial is sponsored by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group out of Queen's University in Kingston. Next slide, please. So the second part of my discussion today is to talk a little bit about my role as a patient representative in IC8, but I, I really wanna change my to our because CCTG has uh, a patient engagement model that involves the patient perspective right from ideation, from the time that uh, a trial is the idea in a, in a researcher's mind, right through to trial closure. So besides my engagement as a member of this trial team, we have patient rep, reps input and engagement throughout the life cycle of this trial. 
So next, please. So this slide, going through the center of the slide, are the chevrons represent the stages of a clinical trial life cycle as it relates to Canadian Cancer Trials Group. The boxes at the top of this slide, I'm not going to go through this detail with you, but the boxes at the top of the slide are meant to indicate the roles that researchers and CCTG central office staff uh, play at, at, at throughout the life cycle of this trial. And at the bottom, I want to give you an indication of what our patient representatives do, starting with right at the very beginning with trial development, priority setting and ideation. So when a, a new proposal is developed, we have patient representatives who are part of the uh, disease site committee, disease site being cancer site, brain cancer, breast cancer, um, et cetera. And those reps ensure inclusion of patient-centered endpoints to accompany the scientific question that's being asked. They provide the patient perspective in the trial design and identify any patient barriers that they might be able to see to help ensure patient feasibility and ultimately affect accrual. Next, please. We have uh, at the trial approval level, we have patient representatives who are equal members in scoring and prioritizing CCTG trials. Next, please. Once a trial is approved and a protocol and consent are being written, we have again reps from the disease site committees who are reviewing the protocol for inclusion of those patient-centered endpoints to accompany that all important scientific question that's being asked. And again, to provide the patient perspective and trial design and continuing to identify patient barriers to accrual. At trial launch and execution, uh, we uh, are very active in assisting in the preparation of plain language patient facing materials like the ones I've just shown you. We um, attend weekly um, trial meetings uh, as a member of the trial team and we are monitoring accrual along with the trial team to help identify patient related issues that may arise. Uh, next please. Along with that, we have data safety monitoring uh, uh, patient reps who sit on the data safety monitoring committee looking for trial and safety issues along with other um, members of that committee. Next, please. And finally, at trial closure, uh, we will play a role in informing the knowledge translation and, ex and exchange uh, associated with this research and will be supporting widespread dissemination of the study findings across patient communities in Canada. So that's um, just uh, you know, a real mile high view of, of how we engage patient, patients uh, in, in all of our trials, not just this trial, and, um, and how we draw. And in doing that, we, we draw on the training and knowledge that's been provided to us by CCTG and CCTG recognizes that patients are people first. And in that regard, I am able to draw on skills from my professional background, in my case, that's marketing, for many aspects of contributing to this project. And um, also, for example, plain language patient summaries that we have reviewed here um, today. Next slide, please. So that's, uh, that's it for what, what I'd like to speak about today, that in transitioning to uh, Dr. Aura and Dr. O'Callaghan, I would like to just pop into a little video explaining a little bit more about IC8. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So take it away. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected each and every one of us. But if you are a cancer patient undergoing active treatments like chemotherapy, the stakes are even higher. Not only do the cancer and the treatments often weaken the immune system, but these patients must come to the hospital or clinic to receive their cancer treatments, so they cannot strictly self-isolate. Many studies have confirmed that cancer patients undergoing active treatments are three to four times more likely to have a life-threatening COVID-19 infection as compared to the general population. 
There is renewed hope with the rollout of a COVID-19 vaccine, but unfortunately, the vaccines have not yet been tested in immunosuppressed patients, including cancer patients on active treatments such as chemotherapy. For this reason, several Canadian jurisdictions have recently indicated that they will not be offering the vaccine to these patients yet because of the lack of data on safety and efficacy. We need to find a way to protect our vulnerable cancer patients. Trained immunity is a new concept in our understanding of the immune system. It means that exposing a person's immune system to a specific type of microbe, like a specific bacteria or virus, can strengthen that person's immune system and help protect them from a second, completely different and unrelated infection. Basically, it's like taking your immune system to the gym and training it to be better prepared for the next infection. This was first seen with one of the oldest vaccinations, BCG, a weakened bacteria that is used to protect against tuberculosis, otherwise known as TB. In several population studies, people that were vaccinated with BCG were 40% less likely to die, and this was because they were protected against other lung infections caused by unrelated bacteria and viruses. In a recent clinical trial, elderly patients who were vaccinated with BCG were over 70% less likely to get a viral lung infection. BCG has also been shown to improve the protection following vaccination with other vaccines, like the flu shot, because of this trained immunity effect. All of these studies suggest that trained immunity with BCG could protect patients from a COVID-19 infection, and for this reason, BCG is being tested as a non-specific vaccine in healthcare workers in over 15 studies around the world. Unfortunately, BCG is not considered safe for cancer patients it is a live vaccine, which means it is made from a live bacteria that, while weakened, can still infect and spread in cancer patients without a strong immune system, like patients on chemotherapy. IMM-101 is a vaccine that is very closely related to BCG, and it has also been shown to induce trained immunity, but unlike BCG, it is a dead vaccine, so it is considered safe in immunosuppressed cancer patients. In fact, IMM-101 is being developed as an anti-cancer immunotherapy because of its ability to strengthen the immune system. It has already been tested in hundreds of cancer patients and is safe and well tolerated. It was shown in an early phase clinical trial to improve survival in patients with pancreatic cancer. This safety data, combined with the evidence that IMM-101 can also induce trained immunity, has led the Canadian Cancer Trials Group to conduct the IC8 clinical trial to test the ability of IMM-101 to protect cancer patients from COVID-19 and other viral lung infections. This trial is enrolling at a number of cancer centers across Canada and is open to patients who have cancer and are actively receiving treatments. Participating in this trial does not prevent patients from receiving the COVID-19 vaccine once it is available to them. In fact, the trial will also allow us to test if IMM-101 improves the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine by testing whether patients who received IMM-101 are more immune to COVID-19 after vaccination. The IC8 clinical trial will test the ability of IMM-101 to induce trained immunity and protect immunosuppressed cancer patients from viral lung illness, including COVID-19 improve the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines in immunosuppressed cancer patients, and determine if trained immunity could be an effective vaccination strategy for any future pandemics. To learn more about the ICA clinical trial, visit our website. Thanks for listening. Take care and stay safe. Great, thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Aura and Dr. O'Callaghan. And you may recognize that voice um, in this next presentation. So take it away, Rebecca and Chris. Megan, you're on mute. 
Thank you. Um, I'd just like to jump in with a few slides. Uh, we may have a few additional folks joining us here and I'd just like to make a few housekeeping notes as well. So if you'll bear with me just for one quick second, um, you should see the Summit Speaker Series now, if I could just get a confirmation of that. Perfect. Um, so uh, I'd just like, again, to welcome any new participants who just joined us at two o'clock um, for today's session. And, uh, and to talk a little bit about this series again. So just as a reminder for the new folks who joined, this is a speaker summit series that was started in lieu of our face-to-face -face conference. And it's really an opportunity to, um, to have our funded network investigators of cycle two um, present their research and, and as Judy mentioned, get feedback, get questions and, and uh, provide an opportunity to have a lively discussion about the, the research. Um, so Judy, I really would like to thank you again for, or thank you for first time actually for, for presenting and thank all of our speakers for their time and their participation in this session. But first, um, before opening it up um, back to the session today, I'd like to highlight the next session that's taking place as part of this series. Um, it will be taking place on Thursday, February 4th, and registration information isn't available just yet. So I would say stay tuned, um, watch for it on our social media, in our BioKennerX newsletter, and in the various different avenues that you receive your news information from BioKennerX. So with that being said, just a note again about housekeeping. Oh, excuse me. Um, the session will be recorded and posted to our website. And so you can take a look at that again if, if you miss part of the session. And again, you can also find the information regarding this session uh, on our summit website. And I'll link that information to the chat box again. The Q&A will be taking place at the end of Dr. Rebecca Auer and Chris O'Callaghan's talks, but in the meantime, do feel free to write your questions in the chat box. Uh, that's a good thing to do because it provides an opportunity for other people to read your questions and to upvote um, the ones that are the most popular and that we can get to first and, um, and to prioritize. And then finally, if you are having any technical difficulties, um, please write them in the chat box and uh, I'll get to them as soon as I can. So with that being said, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Rebecca Auer, who will be starting off the talk. Um, she's the scientific director at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute Cancer Therapeutics uh, Program, and she's also a surgical oncologist with the Ottawa Hospital. And then immediately following Dr. Rebecca Auer's talk will be Dr. Chris O'Callaghan, who is a senior investigator with the CCTG and is also a professor with the Department of Public Health at Queen's University. So with that being said, um, I'll turn it to you uh, to share your slides and, and to kick us off, Rebecca. So thank you and welcome. Thanks very much. Uh, do you, can you put it on uh, presenter mode or I can do that? Here. Yeah, I'm just attempting to here. So while waiting for the slides to come up, um, let me first say thank you very much for the uh, invitation by BioCanRx to present um, this study. And thank you to all of you for taking your time out of your day to, um, uh, to listen to the presentation. Uh, and of course, thank you to Judy for introducing it and, uh, and showing the video and explaining it so well. Um, so this uh, clinical trial, just uh, have a little bit more detail about the science behind the idea, and then uh, Dr. O'Callaghan's going to go through some of the uh, clinical trial design elements um, and the uh, um, uh, current uh, status of enrollment, as well as some of the statistical analysis. So we're very fortunate that this trial is funded in part by BioCanRx, uh, as well as the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research. Um, the uh, trial itself is being run by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, as we mentioned, which is funded by the uh, 
um, Canadian Cancer Society. Uh, so by all rights, I should probably have their logo on this slide as well, but we thank them for their support, as well as the Canadian Centre for Applied Research and Cancer Control. And then we have two company partners, Imodulon, who's providing the investigational product, IMM 101, and NK Max, who is providing test kits for um, a, a NK cell assay that we're using um, as part of the trial. So uh, we have already know the title of the trial, so I'll just launch into the slides. Here we go. So what we've learned from uh, the first SARS, SARS-CoV-1 we call it, as well as from uh, over the last uh, year almost, uh, well year actually, of COVID-19, is that there seems to be a dramatic difference in some patients who get uh, the COVID-19 infection, and they re have a relatively asymptomatic or even mildly symptomatic uh, infection. And then we have other patients who have a very severe infection, which is life-threatening and can lead to admission to the ICU. And really, while we're still trying to understand exactly why those two things are different, it appears that the innate immune system and the innate immune system's ability to fight the virus at the very earliest stages of infection is probably quite important in determining which of these categories you'll be in. And so we know that particularly young people and in animal studies in the lab, young mice are able to fight off the virus much better than older patients, older mice, uh, and patients who have chronic diseases, including cancer patients who are on uh, immunosuppressive therapies. In fact, there's been over 25 studies looking at cancer patients' infection uh, with COVID-19. Some of the earliest ones published last winter demonstrated significant increases in ICU admission and death in patients who had cancer and were on active treatment. Um, and, uh, and a total of these studies really suggests that cancer patients on active treatment are about fourfold more likely to have a serious COVID-19 infection, which means one that requires hospitalization and use of a ventilator or intensive care admission. So it's fairly serious if you're on uh, immunosuppressive therapy and you do get a COVID-19 infection. The other thing to note about cancer patients on treatment is many of them can't exclusively self-isolate. So they need to come to the hospital for blood work, for tests, and for treatment, uh, increasing their exposure. So this is a little bit of the science. I'll just explain this uh, diagram a bit. So when you get uh, an infection in your lungs with the SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID-19, it starts to replicate in those lung cells. And in um, healthy individuals and individuals with a strong, robust, early immune system, and we call that first uh, responder immune system the innate immune system, what happens is a group of cells, and these cells are part of that innate immune system, and that includes macrophages and monocytes, dendritic cells, and some of the uh, nonspecific immune cells like natural killer cells, which are just that, they, they kill without necessarily being trained and educated, and gamma delta T cells. So these cells get ramped up in a very efficient way when you have a strong immune system and are able to clear the infection quite quickly before it causes significant damage. And so we think that's what happens in patients who have a relatively mild symptomatic infection. On the other hand, if you have an immune system which is slightly weakened because of chronic illness, age, or cancer, then you have a preponderance of a different type of innate immune cells. And we know this is particularly true in cancer patients, where some of the cells, like the monocytes, for example, are called alternatively activated, or they're more of a suppressor type of a cell. And so when they get exposed to the virus, instead of triggering this active immune response, they instead um, release some uh, signals called cytokines, which dampen the immune response. When the immune response eventually does catch up and start to respond, it's an overactive immune response. So we have this dichotomy where you have an absent immune response early on, you get a lot of virus replication, and that leads to a delayed response, which is way too active, trying to deal with the significant virus infection, and that can lead to the tissue damage that many patients get admitted to the ICU because of lung, uh, lung tissue damage. And I'll talk about how IMM 101 or BCG is able to help change this immune system from uh, a less activated to a more activated 
innate immune system. So this idea of stimulating the innate immune system to help prevent infection uh, has come actually, uh, is, is well studied in veterinary medicine. In fact, it's used in cattle feedlots and during transportation of cattle and pigs um, when they have to be housed in very close quarters. And there's been a lot of investment in this type of strategy in the veterinary world because it's a multi million dollar industry uh, meat. And so having infected cows or sick cows on the feedlot can can totally ruin a, an, an industry or a company. So what happens uh, is that there is a couple of different agents. One of them is called Xylexis and Um, But essentially what they do is they stimulate the innate immune system. So they're not specific vaccines but they give the vaccine to the animals before they're housed in close quarters. And it actually pre prevents, uh, in the case of cows, uh, something called bovine respiratory disease, uh, one of which is uh, caused by coronavirus, a respiratory coronavirus, and it has been shown to work. And this is approved in, in veterinary and uh, um, cattle uh, study, from cattle studies. So we think that maybe the innate immune system might be our best weapon for flattening the curve. So all of our strategies to date have been about social distancing and isolation, and these have definitely worked. But if we could boost up our innate immune system, then patients who might be vulnerable, uh, might have been vulnerable before, are, are strong enough to be able to have a simply an asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection. And we can also similarly reduce the burden on our healthcare system. And so, um, so that's what uh, this strategy really is. And um, very early on during the pandemic, a lot of data was coming out, um, old data was being brought forward looking at uh, BCG, which is one of the oldest vaccines we have. And it's a vaccine that's given in a, a number of different countries uh, to newborns to prevent tuberculosis. And this is particularly true in developing countries, but also in countries like Germany and even Japan where um, they immunize against tuberculosis. And uh, so the question was, could this old TB vaccine protect patients from coronavirus? And that seems like a bit of an odd uh, hypothesis, but it comes from studies that have been done, uh, numerous studies actually that have been done in populations where they've looked at uh, babies who were vaccinated with BCG in many developing countries and in absolutely enormous population-based studies, they showed that these babies were less likely to die. And it wasn't that they were less likely to die of tuberculosis. In fact, uh, the biggest benefit was not at a time when uh, babies and children tend to get tuberculosis. The reduction in mortality was from unrelated, particularly viral respiratory illnesses. And so this really gave the uh, hypothesis that BCG for some reason can protect these children and babies from unrelated respiratory viral illnesses. And this was also studied in some uh, clinical trials uh, showing the same effect. Uh, in September, this paper was published um, and basically this was a clinical trial of almost 200 patients. They were randomized to, uh, and these patients were older patients who'd been admitted to the hospital for a respiratory infection. And at the time of discharge, when they were better, they were randomized to receive an immunization with BCG or a placebo. Um, and then they followed them for the next year to see if they were less likely to get a, um, uh, a, a respiratory illness or any other type of infection. And um, what they showed was that there was a significant reduction in the development of new infections. And this was particularly uh, apparent for uh, viral respiratory illnesses, where patients um, who were vaccinated were up to 70% less likely to get a viral respiratory illness of unrelated, obviously unrelated to TB, which is a bacteria. Um, so this was a very provocative study that was published. It was, the study itself was done pre-COVID-19, uh, but um, certainly uh, suggests that this may also prevent patients from getting uh, symptomatic COVID-19 infections.
Um, and this was just to show you that uh, in this particular study, it was the respiratory infections, all respiratory infections, particularly that were um, uh, protected from and particularly those of viral origin. And this means that we favor the BCG arm of the study to prevent infections. So it actually protected from all infections, but particularly those respiratory infections. Ah, sorry. So why does this work? It's a concept called trained immunity, which basically is uh, in the simplest form, trained immunity suggests that if you take your immune system and you strengthen it with another a challenge, a unrelated challenge, in this case, like BCG, uh, you prime that immune response to better respond to a next, uh, a next insult, a microbial insult that's unrelated to the first. And so essentially what we think we do is to, uh, uh, in this picture, is to make these immune cells more active um, by stimulating them uh, through these things called toll-like receptors. So through innate uh, receptors, we can make these cells much stronger and better at responding uh, the next time a virus uh, or bacteria comes along. And how this, why we think this works is that there you know, these cells have the same DNA um, and uh, regardless of whether they are trained or not trained, but essentially what happens is when you train them with, in this case, BCG or another um, bacteria that has this effect, you basically change the expression of the um, immune uh, genes. So we change those M2 or there's those suppressive type macrophages and dendritic cells to those that are more activated and able to respond, releasing the molecules or cytokines that are going to activate the immune response. And they do this by silencing the suppressor genes and, and opening up or activating the, uh, the genes that will uh, stimulate the immune response. Um, so this is an interesting study that was done uh, recently that also showed that if you vaccinated a patient, uh, this was actually a healthy subject study. So these are not patients, but they took healthy subjects and they vaccinated them with BCG or they gave them a placebo. And then they exposed them to the yellow fever virus. It was an attenuated yellow fever virus, but these, patients, these uh, subjects, uh, experimental subjects did get sick uh, with this attenuated virus. And what they were able to show is that those uh, subjects who were vaccinated with the BCG had less viremia, so less viral particles in the blood. And this seemed to be related to the ability to release this cytokine called IL-1 beta, which uh, is a marker of an activated innate immune response. So really like a, like a science experiment in patients um, to show that this effect actually works and, and a little bit about why it works. So Understandably, this was very exciting, uh, and there's been a number of studies now, I think uh, 14 or 15 studies around the world that are using BCG to vaccinate frontline healthcare workers and protect them from uh, COVID-19 infection uh, around the world. And these studies are yet to be reported, but it will be interesting to see whether BCG is similarly going to work in this uh, population of patients. But as mentioned in the video, BCG is contraindicated in cancer patients who are getting immunosuppressive treatments because it is an attenuated live vaccine. That means that if your immune system isn't working, you could get sick with this vaccine. Vaccine. And so it's not allowed to be given in patients who have cancer and are on active treatment. So IMM 101 is a, is a vaccine that's made by a company called Imodulon, and it's very similar to BCG. Um, BCG is a bacteria called Mycobacterium bovis. IMM 101 is a bacteria called Mycobacterium obuense. So it's very similar. It has a very similar effect in laboratory studies. And um, the way they process it is that they grow the bacteria, but then they kill it, so they inactivate it. So it is safe for cancer patients. Um, this uh, uh, vaccine, IMM-101, is being developed as an immunotherapy for cancer patients. It's been used in about 300 or so patients uh, in clinical trials up till now with a very good safety profile um, in patients who've had melanoma and all sorts of different types of solid cancers. Uh, this one trial is probably the largest that's been done with this particular agent, and it's in patients with pancreatic cancer. And these patients were randomized to receive 
uh, chemotherapy plus or minus IMM 101. And the red line here in this survival curve shows that um, the IMM 101 patients had a longer survival compared to those that did not receive IMM 101. And it was well tolerated in this study. So it's early days for this um, vaccine, but it certainly seems to be safe in cancer patients and does seem to boost the immune system based on some of the uh, correlative studies that they've done in animals and humans. This is just a little bit about the side effect profile. The most common side effect is an injection site reaction, very similar to BCG, where you get some redness, swelling, and even sometimes a little breakage of the skin um, on the arm, usually where the injection is given. And about 10% of patients will have a fever after. Um, other uh, side effects, I mean, these patients are on chemotherapy, so it's a bit hard to know what side effects are related to the IMM 101, but overall, there's been a low rate of other side effects, not clear if they're definitely related to the vaccine or not. This is just an example of different kinds of injection site reactions with IMM 101. Um, most of them are kind of the grade one and two, where you get um, some redness, swelling, um, and a little bit of discomfort. So certainly more than you would get with your average uh, flu shot, um, but, uh, but certainly tolerable. So in this study, the rationale is, as I mentioned, cancer patients are at high risk for symptomatic COVID-19 infections that can delay or interfere with their cancer treatments. They have a weakened innate immune system, and they cannot completely self-isolate. So we hypothesize that if we immunize these cancer patients with IMM-101, we could boost their innate immune system and reduce the incidence of symptomatic or severe uh, COVID-19 infections or other infections that might disrupt their cancer therapy. Uh, the primary endpoint of this study is um, a WHO definition of an influenza-like influenza illness, um, and that includes a cough and a fever with less than 10-day onset. And in addition, it has to result in a change or delay in the cancer treatment. And that's kind of what we wanted it to be, a very clinically relevant study. If these patients can't get their treatments, then they may not um, have a a good, uh, as good a cancer outcome, and so we want to avoid that. We have a number of secondary endpoints that allow us to look specifically at COVID-19 infections. We can also look at those severe COVID-19 infections, the ones that result in hospitalization or death. We're going to be taking blood, so we're able to look at whether patients are more likely to develop antibodies against COVID-19. And so, for example, if patients are on this study and then subsequently vaccinated with a COVID-19 vaccine, we'll be able to tell whether those patients develop immunity through a blood test and, um, and also whether IMM-101 can improve the ability to develop immunity. Um, and we're going to look at uh, whether it's a cost-effective strategy for Canadians and uh, also look at some of the uh, cancer outcomes in these patients to see if there's any signal that it's helping with their cancer treatment. There's a number of different correlative endpoints, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but all this to say is we are taking blood, and this is work is supported by the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research, to be able to see whether in our cancer patients we're seeing some of these changes that I told you have been seen in studies with BCG and also have been seen in smaller studies of patients who got IMM 101. So we'll be able to tell whether we can uh, have an improved innate immune response and whether that improved innate immune response following vaccination correlates with uh, prevention of a symptomatic respiratory viral illness. Um, and we can also look at whether those changes in the innate immune cells are from uh, silencing or promoting different types of genes that are expressed in those cells. Finally, it's important to note that um, previous studies have shown that BCG can improve the efficacy of unrelated vaccines. The same effect, but the second insult, instead of being a viral infection, is a viral vaccine. And this has been shown with the flu shot in the past. We will have the ability to look at that with respect to the flu shot, since all of the patients on this study are getting the flu shot as well. But we'll also potentially be able to investigate this question as it relates to the COVID-19 infection. So as, or sorry, vaccine. So as you probably know, 
the studies that have looked at the approved COVID-19 vaccines, the uh, Pfizer one, for example, and the Moderna, they did not include cancer patients who are on chemotherapy. And so we hope that these patients are uh, protected just as well in terms of serum antibody responses, but we don't know that. And there is reason to believe they may not have a stronger protection because that's the, the, the truth in terms of the flu vaccine, for example, cancer patients on treatment don't have as much protection with the vaccine. So our study would be an opportunity to see what the protection is with the COVID-19 vaccines and also whether IMM 101 can improve that protection. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. O'Callaghan now, who's gonna go through the inclusion, exclusion, and the study uh, design. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, I really uh, appreciate also the opportunity uh, to uh, present uh, today, and we're very grateful to BioCanRx for supporting this study. I'm gonna start off by telling everyone that IC8 is not just a meaningless set of letters and a number. Uh, it's, it, it stands for infection control. And the number eight means that this is the, in fact, the eighth infection control study that the Canadian Cancer Trials Group has done. Um, it's certainly one of the most unusual ones, and it does take us a little bit of outside of our uh, typical, I would say, comfort zone of clinical trials. Um, one of the things that that means is that we, we want this trial to be as broad as possible. Uh, our normal trials are very focused on specific cancer types, breast cancer patients, even to the extent of the stage of the breast cancer or, or some biomarker that uh, distinguishes it. In comparison, the IC8 trial, we're trying to be as broad as possible and our inclusion and exclusion criteria, which are the uh, metrics by which we de determine whether a patient is appropriate for the trial, uh, we've tried to be as broad as, as well. And just remembering that those criteria are, are there for a reason. They help us select appropriate patients, both from the perspective of being sure that we have the right ability to answer the question, that we have a valid scientific outcome, but they're also there to ensure the safety of the patients who are enrolling on the study. So the first criteria that, that we have identified is that we, we're, we're obviously targeting patients who are undergoing cancer treatment, and, and we want those to be the patients for whom their exposure is, uh, is at highest risk. Um, for those of us who are on the call today in Ontario, we know that uh, tomorrow at midnight, we will all be told to stay home for anything but the most essential reasons. Uh, and yet our cancer patients will still be the next morning getting up and getting in their cars and going to the cancer treatment centers to receive their treatment. They simply can't afford to socially isolate the way the rest of us might be. Um, we also want to optimize the potential impact of the IMM 101. And so another set of eligibility criteria here are uh, targeting those patients who have the, the known risk factors for more severe COVID. Uh, older patients, uh, patients who have comorbidities such as hypertension or diabetes, or another relevant chronic condition such as a, a heart condition or a lung condition. And these are, you know, these are not unusual uh, coincidence with patients who are, are receiving cancer. Uh, I think it would be safe to say that the demographics of our, our typical cancer patient are patients who are older and with comorbidities. It, it, at least in part, is likely to explain one of the, the, the reasons as to why these patients are at greater risk for more severe COVID infections. Um, patients who are, have higher body mass indices, and of course, uh, any patient who is living in a nursing home or a long-term care facility is a, a really strong candidate for our trial. At the same time, we do need to be able to ensure that, that we're able to monitor these patients for sufficient length of time uh, to see the primary outcome if it, if it happens or when it happens, I should say. And so we do also require uh, our patients to have a, a life expectancy of at least six months. And then importantly, they must be patients who are willing to get the recommended seasonal vaccines such as influenza. Um, we, we debated uh, making those mandatory on our study, obviously, with a composite primary endpoint like influenza-like illness, we want to be sure that uh, 
that we are optimizing the prevention for those patients. And as Rebecca has pointed out, we believe that IMM 101 may actually be synergistic uh, with both the influenza and pneumococcal and, and hopefully the COVID-19 vaccines. So at the same time that we are including patients, we, we also need to exclude some for, uh, for reasons of both validity and safety. Uh, patients with prior COVID-19 infections are, are to be excluded. Uh, in the short term, we're excluding patients who effectively have the primary endpoint. So if a patient attends the clinic and, and is uh, ill with an influenza-like illness, they would not be eligible. Uh, from the safety perspective, we want to exclude patients who are on other known experimental therapies. Uh, as Rebecca has pointed out, although many hundreds of patients, uh, cancer patients, have received IMM 101 and they have received it in conjunction with a variety of chemotherapy, uh, we do not know uh, for uh, non-standard experimental therapies what the potential interaction is. And so through an abundance of precaution, um, we exclude those patients from participating on the study. Uh, similarly, known active infections, uh, known allergic reactions to other mycobacterial products or the BCG vaccine, uh, again, it would be more likely or expected to be more likely that those patients might have a, a more serious uh, potential allergic reaction to IMM 101. And then finally, the last two criteria that I'm highlighting here indicate that al although we are targeting patients who are uh, immunocompromised because of their cancer or their treatments, we are steering also away from the patients who are specifically more highly uh, immunocompromised, either through something like an untreated HIV infection or, or patients who, uh, for uh, legitimate reasons, uh, are receiving uh, very high dose uh, or immunosuppressive doses of corticosteroids or other immunosuppressive agents. The study itself is relatively simple. Um, if a patient meets those previous criteria and they're attending the clinic, they're eligible to participate. Uh, if they do elect to participate, they're, they're randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either the IMM 101 uh, vaccination arm or an observation arm. And to all intents and purposes, um, we try to keep the, uh, the observation or the intensity of monitoring the same between those two arms. Although on the observation arm, uh, a lot of that uh, is through virtual means, again, uh, we, we try to the extent possible, although we realize that these patients are at greater risk of COVID infection through attending the clinic, we try not to exacerbate that by adding unnecessary visits. So the patients who are on the IMM 101 would receive uh, a three course of vaccine. Um, for those who know that that differs from the BCG vaccine. So although the two are very similar in their purported mechanism of action and, and uh, uh, training of the innate system, because this vaccine is killed and doesn't replicate, uh, unlike BCG, which is given once, this vaccine has booster doses. And so you can see in the top right here that the initial dose is a, a relatively small volume. It's given through a very, very fine needle, a tuberculin syringe. Uh, and then there are booster doses, which are half of the initial dose that are given at day 15 and 45. Uh, and then once the patients are, are followed up um, uh, subsequently, uh, we're, we're really doing that in conjunction with their existing clinic visit schedules, or we're doing it remotely by contacting the patients virtually. Um, just to point out that, that we, we recommend, we're not mandating, but we are strongly recommending uh, and we require patients be willing at least to, to consider receiving the pneumococcal and influenza vaccines, which are also recommended for these patients. So again, the, the fact that we have a composite primary endpoint of influenza-like illness means that we want to protect these patients not only uh, against COVID-19, but against the other uh, bacterial and respiratory infections that they may common, more commonly uh, threaten them. In terms of the sample size, we, we haven't really spoken about it previously, but this is a large trial. Uh, we're targeting enrolling 1,500 patients, um, 750 to each arm. Again, for those in the know, this is a, a sample size that uh, we do base, obviously, on a target of 80% power and looking at a two-sided 
uh, alpha to minimize our type one experiment wise error rate. But for vaccine trials, the difficulty always in terms of calculating a sample size is that they are dependent not only on those metrics that we're targeting, uh, but also on the actual challenge rate. Uh, and so it's, an, it's a, it's a catch-22 situation that the more infection we see uh, in the control or observational arm of the study, the smaller number of patients we need. Uh, and so if you look at this, uh, this uh, table here, what it says to you is that uh, at even a very, very small rate of infection, uh, in the observational arm, um, we would still have a reasonable power to look for uh, a, uh, a benefit or a reduction in that incidence of infection that's in keeping with what Rebecca was quoting in the other studies. So if you remember back to the BCG study and the elderly and, and other studies, uh, they quote reductions in, in uh, rates of respiratory uh, infections uh, upwards of 70%. So, you know, if our study uh, results in a higher level of infection, you know, the way, one way to think of this might be that if the, if the COVID second wave uh, results in a higher level of, of infection in patients in the observational arm, um, we're going to be able to detect even smaller benefits potentially. Uh, our plan is to follow patients for at least 12 months after their enrollment. Uh, and we are planning one interim analysis. And again, when that interim analysis occurs is dependent on the number of events being uh, sufficient to let us at least have a chance uh, of seeing an early benefit. We, we have an, what I would say a very optimistic target. Um, we want to recruit 50 patients per participating center per month. And we're not there yet, but we're in the early stages and we're moving towards that target. Uh, one of the factors that we also had to consider uh, in this study is uh, where COVID is worst in Canada, worse in Canada. Um, right now, you can see that we're clearly, uh, you know, embarking on our second wave. Uh, and uh, the second wave is by no means done. Um, despite our best control efforts, I think it's likely that uh, even the most optimistic uh, of the scientists will tell us that we have many more months uh, of higher, higher rates of COVID infection to endure. Uh, the rates are highest in Ontario, Quebec and Alberta and have been consistently. Uh, and we have targeted uh, participating centers in those provinces accordingly. Um, our, our colleagues uh, in Newfoundland and, and Nova Scotia have done such a marvelous job in avoiding the infection that it, it really uh, is difficult for us to justify opening sites uh, in those provinces. So we are open broadly, but within uh, those target provinces uh, at the current time. Uh, here is a picture of the study team. I'll just go through the sites that are participating. Dr. Roberge at the University of Montreal Hospital is the principal investigator. Uh, Martin Smoregovich at uh, Sunnybrook Hospital, Ros Rosalyn Jurgens in the Hamilton Health Sciences. Uh, Rebecca, of course, is the study chair and the PI locally in the Ottawa Hospital. Granny O'Kane at Princess Margaret Hospital. Eric Winquist in London Health Sciences Center. George Zagopoulos in McGill. Uh, and then our health economics experts uh, also reside in Sunnybrook, uh, Kelvin Chan and Nicole Mittman. Myself and Dong Sheng Tu are with the Canadian Cancer uh, Trials Group in Queen's University in Kingston. Uh, Dong Sheng is the senior biostatistician and I am the senior investigator. Um, a site that we have yet to open uh, but is moving forward in Calgary will be led by uh, PI of Patricia Tang. Um, and uh, John Bartlett and Lazlo Radvanyi from the OICR are uh, key uh, correlative uh, scientists who will uh, work with us to sort out many of those uh, uh, parallel questions that Rebecca was referring to. And to date, uh, the, these accrual uh, metrics are from yesterday and the good news is they're already out of date because we've recruited three more patients this morning. Um, you can see that we uh, month on month, having started in October, we are uh, increasing our recruitment rate uh, with 40 patients in, in December, uh, now 13 in January. 
Uh, the codes here relate to uh, uh, the uh, McGill, um, uh, the University of Montreal, uh, Ottawa, Sunnybrook, Princess Margaret, Ham uh, London and Hamilton, which are the sites that have activated. Uh, these sites down here have literally uh, just activated within the last month and are starting to ramp up their accrual. It is a logistically challenging study. The uh, IMM 101 that is supplied to us generously by Imodulon comes in a multi-dose vial uh, and there are complexities of organizing uh, immunization cohorts, uh, particularly in the context of uh, all of our cancer centers are, are, are trying to minimize uh, uh, contact and have social distancing within them. So there's real a real learning curve for us as we as we ramp up but we are steadily improving uh day on day week on week and month on month and uh, i'm cautiously optimistic that we will reach our accrual target and uh, again hopefully demonstrate that imm 101 is a, a beneficial supplemental therapy therapy potentially for cancer patients uh in terms of their cancer but certainly uh, for the prevention of the uh uh, concomitant uh, respiratory infections that threaten them. And I think I'll stop there and, and I think Rebecca and I will open up for questions. Great, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Rebecca. So um, as Chris said, we are open to questions. And there was one that came in the chat at the very beginning. Um, and I think it was, give me a moment here to find the question. Uh, okay, great. So the question is, how um, how can cancer patients undergoing treatment enroll in IC8? Maybe I'll field that one, Rebecca. Um, ask your oncologist straight up the first thing that you should do. I mean, unfortunately, as you've seen, um, for a number of reasons, one, scientific validity, we, we want uh, to conduct the study in areas where COVID risk is highest. Uh, also, we have a limited amount of the IMM 101 available to us, so we, you know, we have to be focused. So those centers that I mentioned are where we are currently activating or about to activate the study. So if you're a cancer patient attending in, in those cities and attending those institutions, uh, ask your oncologist. Oh, sorry, you're, you're muted, Megan. Sorry, my dog was squeaking in the background, so I muted myself. And of course, I need to be told at least twice to unmute, so apologies. Um, another question came in in the chat box, and I just do remind folks to to answer in the Q, or to ask questions in the Q&A box, which is different from the chat box, just so that um, others can see it and can upvote questions. But nonetheless, um, the question in the chat box first was, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, and for leading a much needed trial. So the question is, would you be able to measure um, the T cell response against SARS-CoV-2 and common tumor antigens, thinking about epitope spread in both? And then as a lead up, um, oh, <laughs> uh, there is a chat by Q and A, sorry, we're, we're live time question and answering here, um, apologies. So the follow-up to that question is, because antibodies against uh, SARS-CoV-2 tend to decrease in time and some patients do not develop them at all. T cells, on the other hand, seem to be a bit more stable and better associated with survival from CoV-2, uh, excuse me, from COVID. So I, I'll field that question, it's an excellent question. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Samudio. So I think uh, you know we hadn't we haven't put in uh, in the actual correlatives uh, to be able to look at T cell responses. But I think um, you know the trial was designed before an antibody or before a vaccine was available. So really, we hadn't um, put in the correlatives that would specifically allow us to look at you know the vaccine response. For example, um, we do have. Uh, we do have an optional blood draw for patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19, um, and um, and so that that's a, a potential. We're only collecting um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells at the Ottawa site uh, for logistic reasons and also cost. It's very sort of expensive and time-consuming to collect those at all the time points. But um, we will have a cohort of Ottawa patients that we have collected uh, PBMCs from, and. Um, in theory, we could put in an amendment to look at uh, T cell responses. 
So I think part of that depends on the event rate and part of that will depend on the number of patients that get vaccinated with a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, um, whether that's something we'd, uh, we'd wanna look at, but it's an excellent idea. Great, thank you, Rebecca. So then the next um, question has quite a nice uh, preamble and I won't um, read it all for the sake of brevity, but I invite everyone to take a look at it. Um, the question is surrounding type one versus type two immunity. And the question um, specifically relates to whether you have knowledge about type one versus type two cytokine profile, what the, excuse me, what the cytokine profile looks like after treatment with um, IMM 101. And then how confident are you that uh, this treatment wouldn't cause harm? And um, why not use type one pattern recognition receptor agonist to ensure the trained immunity has the correct bias? So that's also an excellent question. Very, uh, very uh, scientific craft. <laughs> so um, maybe I'll start with the first question or the last question first. So in, in terms of um, just using a very specific uh, you know, a TLR composite or PRR a composite of uh, molecules that will give you the, the ideal, um, let's say, cytokine response. Um, the problem is that that will only last for a very sort of short period of time. So there are a number of trials on clinicaltrials.gov, or, or not a number, but a few certainly that are looking at giving things like daily uh, oral um, interferon alpha or something like that, which, you know, would give you a sort of daily boost of your um, cytokine response. Um, but, uh, but you have to give it all the time. And so the, the benefit of this IMM 101 and BCG approach is that um, ultimately you get sort of epigenetic modifications of these innate immune cells and, uh, and that should be long lasting. And, and at least in the studies that they've done to date, it seems to be lasting for at least a year and possibly longer, may even last for, for more than a year. So it's, uh, you know, one vaccination that would potentially last you for the duration um, of, uh, of exposure, uh, or at least the duration of your chemotherapy. Um, so I think that's why using uh, a vaccine strategy like this versus a combination or concoction of, um, you know, pattern recognition receptor agonists or something, uh, the, the second one, um, so we don't know for sure that the uh, cytokine profile that will ultimately um, uh, be promoted with IMM-101 vaccination is the ideal one to protect from COVID-19. What we do know is that uh, some of the changes seen with BCG in animal studies are similar to the changes that we see with IMM-101 in animal studies. Um, we know that uh, innate immune boosting happens following IMM 101, but we, we don't have the, the depth of um, correlative analysis uh, with IMM 101 that is available with BCG. It's simply a newer uh, drug and less scientists have studied it. But this uh, particular study is actually a fantastic opportunity to ask that question. So well, one of the correlatives that I didn't talk about a lot, but we'll be taking the uh, PBMCs from the Ottawa patients and um, stimulating them with various uh, uh, agonists and seeing what cytokine profile they do produce. And, um, and that should give us particularly things like IL-1 beta, for example. And that should give us some indication of whether um, we are on the right track if we can see that that um, correlates with functional assays. We're doing the NKVU assay. And also in an ideal world that that correlates with events, um, which is a bit of a harder thing to, to see in a smaller subset. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question is simply, is the study mask, are you giving placebo injections? We are not, um, and we did toy with that, but as, as we saw at, at least 16 to to 20% of the patients have a local reaction. Um, and so blinding and masking in that uh, environment is difficult. Now that said, it raises all sorts of questions about the potential for, for bias. And we've, we, we're, we're very cognizant that with a composite endpoint, like uh, a clinical endpoint, like influenza-like illness, that there is a risk of that. And so what we've implemented is uh, a sort of a post hoc uh, blinding assessment. So if a, if a patient uh, is suspected to have met the criteria for our primary endpoint at a site, 
uh, a an investigator at the site who is un, um, unaware of the patient's arm of allocation is asked to adjudicate whether or not they have met the primary endpoint sufficiently to be declared an event. So it's not true blinding in the sense that the patient is not blinded. Uh, those who are dealing with the patient on a daily basis are not blinded, uh, but it does provide us with at least some assurance that we can protect against uh, ascertainment bias for our primary endpoint. Thank you. Um, so again, I invite everyone to um, answer or ask questions in the Q and A. And I'd also, at the end of this three o'clock or this hour, we're in theory moving into um, a more general um, Q and A with Judy. And I almost think that we can we can bring that in as well. So we can just keep doing Q and A. Um, so if there are any patients or folks that uh, would like to ask any sort of plain language type questions, please do. Um, we invite all questions at this point. And um, so there are about four minutes left. I think perhaps uh, before we start losing people, I'd just like to make a couple of points before jumping back into Q&A. And that's that, uh, again, I'd like to thank all of our participants, um, our speakers, of course. And uh, just a reminder that uh, it would be very, we would be very grateful for you to fill out the survey that will pop up at the end of the session when you exit. And that will allow BioCanRx and the speakers to, um, to improve on our series and, and talks and whatnot. Um, so that's all I have to say before, uh, before I hand it back to you. And in fact, we, we do have um, another question and that is, has IMM 101 ever been employed nasally or orally? Would this be more effective? And, uh, <laughs> and asking for the mucosal immunologists in the audience. Rebecca, I, 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 perhaps you know more working with the company than I do, but to the best of my knowledge, they have not. Um, to date, it's been employed exclusively intradermally. Um, I will point out that the, uh, the dosing regimen that we're using on our study of the, the three, so the initial inoculation followed by two boosters, is actually one of the lower uh, dose uh, combinations that the company has employed. So uh, in, in the specific study that Rebecca quoted in which uh, survival uh, advantage was seen uh, for IMM 101 given in combination with chemotherapy in patients with advanced pancreatic cancer, uh, it was given uh, on multiple occasions uh, to those patients over time. So um, uh, for those who, who don't know, uh, advanced pancreatic cancer has a particularly poor prognosis and essentially those patients were treated uh, by repeated injections of IMM 101, albeit intradermally, uh, as long as they could tolerate. And so the dosing was, was substantively higher than, than what we have in ours. But not intranasally or, uh, or uh, in a mucosal uh, with a specific attempt to uh, engage mucosal immunity. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'm not definitely not a mucosal immunologist, um, not even really an immunologist at all. But um, I think it, it's a good question. Um, I don't think the company has done any studies, even preclinical ones in that space. And I'm not sure about BCG. I haven't thought to look that up. But the concept, it makes sense to me. I mean, if you want to activate those innate immune cells in the lung, doing trained immunity right in the lung may, makes sense. But I'm not sure it's been tested yet. I almost did it again. I didn't. I caught myself. Um, great. So I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, I have a broader question, I think, for all of you, and that is lessons learned. Um, so I know you had mentioned that this was a very complex trial. It had many different logistical considerations. And so perhaps I could ask all three of you, what would you say that um, your lessons learned that you'd like to pass on to others who may be uh, engaging in a clinical trial or um, acting as a patient representative? If all three you could perhaps if all three of you, excuse me, could could mention your lessons learned. Put you on the spot. <laughs> who's who's going to go first? Um, I, I guess I will go first. I, I, I did say it before, Megan, th this trial is a little bit outside of our wheelhouse in terms of uh, the complexity. Never underestimate the complexity of trying to operationalize a clinical trial. Um, when we were first approached by the company, uh, you know, I think we could argue that the science is very sound and valid here, 
we had an opportunity to, uh, to perform this trial. And against that, we had a, a limited supply of the IMM 101. And so we, we have, I wouldn't say we've struggled, but we've really had to pay attention to the minutiae of how we will organize vaccination clinics, how we will recruit patients uh, and, and pool them into cohorts for, for immunization, uh, how we will minimize the inevitable wastage of drug. Uh, it's our most valuable resource at the moment in the trial. And so for me, uh, I, the lesson that I, I've learned here is that uh, it, it, you really have to pay attention to the details uh, when, when moving to something that's uh, new or, or slightly different. I, um, I think for me, this has been a really amazing learning opportunity. I mean, I sort of, um, this was part of my research program and, and really excited about this concept of boosting innate immunity uh, in cancer. And then so this uh, a possibility of boosting it to protect our cancer patients from COVID-19. And I have to think about when this all started, when Chris and I started talking, this is when like you couldn't even leave your house to uh, walk around the block or, you know, you wave to your grandparents outside the window and stuff. So we really didn't know what this tsunami was, uh, was going to be. And uh, I'm not sure I even thought we would still be here uh, almost a year later. But um, so for me, I would say like what Chris says is, is really true. I, I never, all of those details, um, fortunately, were all looked after by the CCTG and by Chris. So two things I learned. One is like, if you want to get something done, pair with Chris. Like that's, <laughs> he's just amazing. I have, I have never seen anything like it. It's, uh, it's, quite, it's, it's quite amazing. So it's been really fun to be part of that team. Um, and the CCTG, uh, really, their expertise in this space is second to none. So it was kind of like um, grabbing the coattails of this machine that just knows what they're doing. And, um, and so that, that's been a really fun uh, to be part of this team and, um, and to see this become a reality. Um, I'm always worried that Chris is going to give up on me eventually and say this isn't worth it because it's just one thing after another that seems to come up. But um, we, have a, we still have a window, I think, to get this trial done. I think this trial is hugely important for this pandemic and for our cancer patients today. I would love to think we're never going to have another pandemic. I don't think that's true. And I think that this trial will also inform us um, what to do, if and when that should happen. Um, and so, uh, you know, we'll have this, this in our back pocket ready to go if, uh, if another pandemic um, comes around. So I think, and protecting our cancer patients from the flu season that happens every year as well. So there's so many reasons to get this trial done. Um, so I hope we I hope we're successful. So I'll, I'll just echo some of those comments. I guess for me, the lesson learned uh, along the way is the dynamic changing environment. Uh, I, I don't think any of the other CCTG trials that I, I've been involved in have had the dynamics of this one. Every week on the uh, clinical trials meetings for IC8, there's something new that has appeared um, in the environment. Uh, for example, learning that uh, when, the, when, when the COVID general vaccines were introduced, learning that the, uh, uh, the exclusion uh, criteria for many of those trials um, excluded people with compromised immune systems and that uh, many of our cancer patients wouldn't qualify. I, and I, I just have to also reach out and, and accolades to um, the, the trial team, everyone in all of those centers, every time something new came up, there was certainly um, uh, ways of overcoming and, and moving forward. So it's, it's been uh, a very great learning experience. And again, a dynamic environment versus a static um, environment that many trials experience. I would love a little bit more static environment sometime, Judy. <laughs> Thank you all for, for those comments. And um, there is another question. I think it's the same question that I didn't provide the preamble for. And so for the sake of ensuring that, um, that I'm asking the question in full and, and that, the, that the question is asked in a way that uh, elicits the appropriate response, I will read the preamble. 
Um, so, and bear with me, BCG is a live intracellular bacterium, so it induces potent type 1 immunity. IMM 101 is made of heat-killed bacteria that are misinterpreted by the immune system as extracellular pathogens. This could be the result, uh, excuse me, this could result in trained immunity with an incorrect type 2 bias. So the question is, or questions are, um, could this cause study participants to respond suboptimally um, to a natural infection and or a COVID-19 vaccine? Second question, um, induction of type 2 immunity has been linked to enhancement of disease. Has consideration been given to the risk of this occurring in the trial? And I think we talked a little bit about this, but perhaps with that preamble, if, if you wanted to add or, or um, change anything you mentioned. Yeah, so I think um, in terms of the risk of, um, you know, more severe, for example, uh, COVID-19 infections with um, uh, the trained immunity concept, um, I think it's uh, so. If I'm understanding that the second question is if uh, if you induce this um, ro more robust, more activated innate immune response, that's actually been in severe COVID-19 infections been associated with uh, worse outcomes, worse outcomes, and worse survivals um, because there is an overactive innate immune response within the lungs, too much interferon gamma, maybe too too overactivated innate immune response leading to tissue damage. And so that's certainly a uh, concern, um, but but that's not been shown with with BCG. Um, so I guess uh, leading to that to the first question, um, is it possible that you are going to have a different um, immune response with a dead vaccine than the live version of the vaccine um, because of its inability to enter the cell and replicate? Um, I think that's possible, although the murine studies and the correlative human studies to date have suggested that IMM 101 has a similar, uh, changes the phenotype of the uh, NK, gamma, delta, dendritic, and, and macrophage monocytes, both in humans and in, in uh, my, my studies. So I think there's certainly some evidence to suggest that they are working the same way. Um, I, uh, so, you know, the, the trial definitely will follow these and there are, um, you know, if, if there were more uh, events of um, severe COVID-19 infection, for example, in the IMM 101 arm, we would, you know, our, the, the DSMB would, would be following that and would certainly uh, look at that very closely. So, I mean, I think that it's, it's not that we've completely ignored that as a possibility, but to date the preclinical and the uh, human correlative data would suggest that IMM 101 and BCG do have a fairly similar ability in terms of the phenotype of the innate cells and the cytokine profile of those cells. So I don't know if that answers the, the question. Yeah, I would only echo, Rebecca, what you've said about the, the, the DSMB oversight as well. I mean, it is an open label study, notwithstanding that we have put in place a, a mechanism that we think allows us to minimize ascertainment bias. Uh, we, we will see the events uh, in an open label way, both the trial team as well as the DSMB. And in the event that there was any suggestion of uh, moving in the wrong direction in terms of more severe events or more events uh, in the treatment arm, then, then that would be a cause for the trial to be stopped. Okay, thank you all. Um, I think that's great. I, I really appreciate um, the time to answering questions. And I think at this point, I would like to have Judy maybe uh, come online. And from three o'clock to 3.15, we really wanted to save time for the patient perspective at the end of the, uh, the talks. And so Judy, I, I wanted to maybe end with you and see if you have any more comment, uh, feed, provide feedback, excuse me, on um, Chris and Rebecca's talk from the patient perspective and maybe close us out with any final remarks that you have. Yeah, thank you very much, Meg. And so uh, I, think, I think we've covered a lot of information in this time frame, but I would just like to reemphasize that, um, uh, I guess what, what I opened with was uh, any feedback from the audience in terms of um, what you see as opportunities for us to um, you know, um, increase accrual, or any better, um, and anything that you might have to offer us in these few minutes would be appreciated. And um, I, I guess overall, from a mile high patient perspective, 
I really feel there's an opportunity here for cancer patients who may not um, be eligible for the vaccine um, uh, uh, at this time, and also an opportunity to bridge uh, between now and, and when they are. So um, very much support this trial, very much appreciate being a part of the trial team and, and uh, have lear I've learned so much working with Rebecca and Chris. Great. So I think that brings us to the end of this session. And again, I just want to thank everyone for participating, for asking questions, for your presentations. As a reminder, this will be posted on our website. Oh, I'm sorry, Rebecca, did you want to say one last comment? I'm so sorry. I was just, um, I hadn't seen that there was a separate Q&A box. And I just wanted to mention, someone said it would be good to have an immunologist review the study design. So just to be clear, we, we absolutely have an immunologist on the study team and all of the science and correlative endpoints uh, are, are vetted and were designed by our immunologist team and were supported by the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research in that regard. But thank you for that comment. Thanks, Rebecca. Any other comments before I uh, close out? Perfect. Um, great. So I think that that brings us to an end. And um, just to reiterate, there will be a survey that will come onto your screen. Um, we do ask for feedback, so please feel free to, um, to, uh, to uh, add anything there. And um, perhaps Judy asked if you have any recruitment ideas, please add that to the, the study survey. And I'd be glad to um, provide that uh, back to you, Judy, and, and to the team. And so we did, I didn't mention all of them, but we have had a few responses coming in from other uh, participants thanking you for, for participating and, and for your talk. So thanks everyone and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.